Anyway, I'm, I'm Dean Mum and this is the Standoff Podcast. Perfectly delivered. I need to get into one thing first, though. Um, the camel. I've not heard that. The camel. Um, yeah, it was Rim, so I'll let Rim take it, really. I don't really remember why. Um, there, wasn't, there wasn't really a reason. It was, one of the, it, was the, it was one of those glorious nicknames that just took shape, wasn't it? You just... Um, yeah. I think to, it was something to do with you, the way you ran. It looked a bit almost like you were galloping up the pitch, head bobbing back and forth while tired and... I don't know, just started calling you the camel and, and call, making camel noises at you. And it, it, it stuck, and I like that. It did stick, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, I don't know, I think it was a bit all arms and legs when... Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I if, mean, if yeah. and when I made a break, so that was, was kind of it, I think. Yeah. Were you taking it with you back to Australia? Hey, no, 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 I, I didn't. I was, uh, I was always mummy here in Australia. Or yeah, that was about it actually. But I, I, yeah, to be to go on that arms and legs theme, I was, I was also called the praying mantis when I was at school. So, I mean, there's a theme there that, that sort of runs across my life. Do you still play ever? No, 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 no. no I play uh, uh, the classic Wallabies as an organisation. Play a couple of times, uh, yeah. and I played sevens and a little bit fifteens, but I uh, I play a bit like Steno and I don't want to go into contact. So I uh, most of the time it belongs your career. Belongs your career. <laughs> it does bro. you're still going. I'm not. I mean you're smart man. <laughs> uh, and then like I'm part of a uh, I'm on the board of a charity called the Collie Player Club, uh, which does celebrate forwards rim. It's a it's a fine charity, but we um, we do matches up in the country here in in Australia, um, and what we do, we put together a rough a team, like a, it's called the Cauliflower Club 15. We put a couple of old Wallabies or Super Rugby players together, and then we play with a, a couple of, uh, and then we put together like an invitational team and play a local country team. And then half the money raised from those games goes to the local club, and then half the money goes to our charity, and we support um, people who have had injuries as a result of, of playing sport. Does Lockie Turner play in that one, Mumsy? Lockie's played in the uh, classic Wallaby stuff, um, but only when we go to Brisbane. He's not a traveller. He sort of just keeps it nice and close to home for him. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's all he's allowed to do. Who knows? Mm. <laughs> well, well, we're here at the um, the end of this month. We've we've kind of taken a bit of a sabbatical whilst we adjust to life at the minute. Carl, Gareth, how are you two both doing? Uh, all good. It's, uh, it's almost become, I, I found about four weeks in, I'd made very few lifestyle changes, which was a concern. Um, but uh, probably need to do a bit more after it all finishes. But no, mostly just, yeah, fill in the days. We did, did um, got two young kids, trying to homeschool a four-year-old. Results in, um, it's been a test. It's been a real test. I don't think she understands sarcasm. That's, 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 that's your strongest cool. suit. Yeah, that's that's caused some problems, and um, yeah, and I just I just can't work out why she can't do what I can do. Um, but uh, yeah, no, we, we're going we're going all right. I, I do a couple of days a week, and my wife is a teacher, so luckily she's not going to end up completely um, completely uh, behind when she returns to school. But other than that, nah, just um, yeah, I don't know. Finding yeah, finding excuses to drink in the week and, and go on Zoom quizzes. Yeah, that's it really. I don't know. We should have come up with a quiz actually today. Which, You've which, been doing yeah. the homeschooling, though, Steve, oh, by the by the looks of things on your your Instagram. Oh, I tell you what. Listen, respect to primary school teachers because the naughty step has been used a lot in my house at the minute. It is stressful. Uh, as rim as 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 I hear to only my wife goes out because she's a GP. She's out there working three days a week. So I left them uh, to try and homeschool a seven and a five year old. And trust me, whenever the one of them decides to put the foot down, he doesn't want to do anything. It is by far one of the most stressful experiences. Um, I am also very nervous that they're getting stupider by the day because it's me trying to teach them. But um, here, it's going all right so far, and I am looking forward to the return of school. Cool. Oh, I'm sure most parents kind of are when they're at schooling age. Uh, the other face that you'll probably be able to see, or if you're listening to us, we're about to introduce the next person. We've heard from Dean Mum, but Mark Stevens, the press officer at um, Pierce and Chiefs, is also with us. Steve, you've got a couple of kids as well. How are you finding life locked down? Um, I'm, well, my oldest is in her teens, so um, she's very good. She just cracks on with uh, her work every day. 
Uh, whereas, like he's a bit like Stino said, uh, my my youngest is six, and uh, he decides when he wants to do some schooling. So some days it's good, some days it's bad. But mum um, has been doing a lot of the schooling. A lot of bravery. Using a lot of bravery at the moment. Oh yeah. It's yeah. almost serendipity, Steve-O, that at the same time you've had to homeschool, you've also developed a hobby of cycling 40 kilometers a day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> decided that, uh, yeah, I'm going to return to work at some stage to a better, leaner man. But uh, hmm. I understand, Steve. I had to go and get myself a punch. Absolutely drenched uh, cycling around. The what was that? I had to go and get myself a punching bag to relieve stress at lunch break. <laughs> get away from them. Very wise. It's literally either the punching bag or I'm putting my head through a wall sometimes. So um, it seems to be working out quite well for me in terms of keeping myself fit, though. So that's always a good thing. There you go. That's a secret. Homeschool your kids and you get fitter. Perhaps maybe that is what I'm. What I am finding. I don't know. I don't know if Steve, if you're doing Joe Wicks in the morning at nine o'clock. You, you, it's harder than you think that is. It's very. Yeah, it I've, I've done PE with Joe as well. It is. Uh, it, yeah, you do get it. I, get, I throw my I, get, I throw my four year old in it. So he needs a little burn of energy. Uh, he's pretty. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't say he's a natural at, uh, at, at the Spider Man jump from side to side or the reverse lunges. He's got a bit of work to do, but he uh, yeah, it's it's pretty good. You do get a blow on if you want to if you want to buy him. Are you uh, are you going on later on? He's going doing fancy dress tonight. Oh, is he? Right, it'll be tomorrow. I'll have, to, I'll have to raid the fancy up, fancy dress store and see what I can do. I don't do it live though because it's probably probably on about, I don't know, when is it? It's probably nine at, at night for me sometimes. So I'm less keen on that. I'd rather my child be asleep. So. <laughs> It'll be six o'clock for you, Mumsy, isn't it? Nine hours difference? Yeah, kids are sleeping yeah. by then, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I can help it, they're in. <laughs> in Bath time at four, them? breakfast at five, in you get. Then you've got a new addition, haven't you, since we uh, last spoke? I do, a new addition. Uh, yeah, Rupert, he's uh, eight weeks old. So um, I, I haven't been back to work since, uh, since he was born, basically. Uh, and uh, neither, is my, uh, neither is Alfie, my four-year-old, been to school since then. So really, because it was sort of all kicking off at that stage, we didn't really want to take any risk uh, with Rupert being around. Not that he was at risk, but if either... Uh, Sarah or I got crook. It was going to be pretty tough to take care of him. So uh, we've, we've been we've sort of self-imposed lockdown for longer than we needed to. But it's we're getting a bit, yeah. You know, it, it's it, it is easing up here in Australia anyway. So we might be able to do like a, uh, a some sort of uh, release and, and get Rupert out into the world at some stage because he's been at home pretty much the whole time. Yeah, well, I was going to ask actually, what is it? What's it been like in Australia? Because it's, it's obviously a completely different country, science-wise, to ours. Have you yeah, had stringent lockdown system. We have, yeah, we've gone into full lockdown, but we never really went into. We weren't as harsh as it seems to have been in Italy or ever when you just can't leave your house for any excuse. We've still, uh, yeah, we've still been able to go to the shops and you know some of our most of our restaurants. All our restaurants and cafes are shut, but they can still do takeaways. So if you want to go, you know, most mornings we'll go for a walk as a family and we can pick up a takeaway coffee from, from the local spot, which just gives you some hint of normality around. And, uh, you know, to be honest, we've been pretty lucky in terms of the number of cases as well. Um, we sort of, we had, I think, six nationally the other day. And apart from some little clusters, we seem to have sort of controlled that community spread a bit. So some of us, and we're also state by state as well here. So you've got not only the what the federal government's saying, but the state government has a say on what happens. So the state government will open up schools and, uh, and then also, you know, each state has been locked down as well as each country. So you can't actually cross state borders either. So it's sort of, I imagine that will ease up the opening up across Australia will be the first thing, but I think there's a they've said a said kids will go back to school in the next couple of weeks. Oh, right. Also, right. our schools never fully shut either, so for those essential workers, their, their kids could still go to school. Yeah, well, there, there's um, I don't know whether it was big news over there, but we kind of got pictures of like Bondi Beach packed last weekend. Uh, has that been a th has that been a bit of a scandal, or is it or, because beaches kind of reopened now, haven't they? 
Yeah, some beaches are open. No, people have been, it was, weather's been stunning as well, which has been hard because it's sort of 28 uh, last weekend, which is pretty nice. And uh, so, no, the beaches were certainly busy. Uh, people, in, yeah, from a Sydney point of view, people in the eastern eastern beaches can get away with a bit more than the rest of us anyway. So they've been, uh, they've been taking the piss a bit, to be honest, <laughs> yeah, by going to the beach in, in mass numbers and hanging out and sunbaking and those sort of things. So, uh, yeah, I think the rest of it's just annoyed that you're probably ruining it for us all. But yeah, it has been has been a concern. Nice of you to join us again, Rim, by the way. Yeah, just yeah. had to nip to the loo, didn't I? Sorry about that. Great timing, Rim. It's worth it, Carl. First, first technology fail of the evening. It's always going to happen. Thanks so well. Thanks so well. Uh, yeah. I, I think I've, I mean. lost out, I've lost out on the stakes in terms of lockdown haircuts as well, which I'm slightly frustrated about. The rest of you look pretty good. I don't know about that. It's starting to look a bit like a cockatoo of some kind. But um, I mean, to be fair, it's yeah, pretty Keep confident. Big. Pretty confident. Keep on that cockatoo. <laughs> 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 Who's missing rugby? Well, I mean, yes, but for different reasons to the others. I get I'll see you, I guess. But yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm missing watching it, but uh, I, I don't miss playing it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do you miss playing it, Steve? Uh, I must be in, in training, yeah. Um, I'm enjoying training at home at, at, at currently and, and not getting knocked around and hit and bashed at the weekends. You've been feeling pretty good physically, which is so strange at this time of year at the best times. But uh, obviously, yes, we'd rather be in playing, especially this time of the year. This is the time of year you want to be playing rugby at the end of the day whenever you know, you're getting into the business end of the season and it's just a bit frustrating that uh, you know, we don't know where, where we stand with yeah. Do you know, Steve-O, where do we stand with it at the minute, as the kind of font of all knowledge? This? <laughs> I think we're all a bit up in the air still. Um, obviously, the government are going to dictate it. France, um, shutting off their football and their rugby, has made it a bit interesting. So Europe, who knows what's going to happen with that. The Premiership are desperate to, um, to get their season done and dusted. And like Steno alluded to there, we are in such a good position on all fronts that we don't want this season to end. And... Uh, I spoke to Ali Heifer and we've done a bit on the website, etc. about, you know, he, he says by the time we do come back, the lads are working hard now, but he wants to hit the season running. He still felt there was more to come from this chief side and Steno is probably the best man to, to answer this. But looking at the guys this year, they, they've hit another level at times in some of the games, but even so, they, they think there's even more to come. Um, and that's refreshing from from people that want to watch us you know we get, we get the boring tag quite often saying we play a certain way but we have to get down the field to play that certain way and uh, I think you know Steen is probably the prime man to answer this one it's probably boring I know when we're scoring 50 points pretty much most, a lot of the games isn't it the biggest thing I think we find is we kind of um, you're not going to be brilliant the whole season and I think that's the the, the way the thing is we we will we were not fantastic, but still winning. And that's an important trait that we've now got as a group. I think it's taken about, well, it's taken years and years to get to that point. I know whenever Dean first came into the club, you know, we were very much still establishing ourselves and trying to create that sort of winning mentality and attitude. And that was kind of the start of when it began. And then we started to get confidence going through. Once we'd won that first LV Cup, for instance, it just gives the club more and more confidence to go forward. And you can see over the last six, seven years how much the progressions have happened and being the last four finals. We obviously said we needed to do a better job in the European Cup. We have, we targeted it this year. We got through the group, we got through it pretty well. And to get a home quarter final put us in a really good position. And, um, you know, but it's like anything, we definitely feel every time we play and we analyze ourselves, we honestly think we can be so much better every single time. Um, you don't always win every game, but we'll always like we we'll always be better the next time we play, and that's whether we win or lose. We make sure we're better. And you look at the group as well, Steve. You know, now a lot of those boys are mid twenties. When Mumsy was with us, they were young lads coming through, but now they are hitting those peak years, aren't they? Yeah, we're lucky. Like we've we've got a little group of them there, like who are now in around that 20, 24, 28 mold, and a lot of them are playing international rugby now, which is great. And actually. There's another little group coming behind them now, which is about 20, 23. You know, there's a group there. There's a load of lads who are off playing for England or 20s, for instance. 
So, you know, it's like there's guys who are establishing themselves in the team and establishing themselves as premiership players. And the average of the squad could be 25, 26, which is really good going forward. We've obviously got a few experienced boys over the top of them um, to try and help out as best as time whenever needed be. But in terms of what we have as a group, we have a great squad of boys together who, and if whatever way they want to finish the season, if they turn around and say you got to play two games a week, I would love that because I think we have a squad that can do that. The average age has bumped up a couple of numbers by you, Stina. Would be 24, it's now 26. The funny thing with that is, I'm still not the oldest one in the squad. I'm not even well, in the top two. Did Budgie come back, has he? I'm not even in the top two. <laughs> one of your old mates is still hanging in there, keeping pushing us forward. Who's that? Phil? Oh, Gregory Holmes. Oh, oh yeah, he is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And obviously, Elvis just, Elvis, Elvis just signed a new contract with 52 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. one Elvis, knows. We've never really locked in Elvis's... Uh, Unless, we're, in Elvis, we're in Elvis's passport age rather than you know, what he real age is as well. So we don't really know that. Unless you're going to cut Elvis open and count the rings, there's no way, of, there's no way you can count that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck doing that. Yeah, yeah. You've got a few more years on the athlete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to that time when you when you did join the club, Dean, and when you know you had in, incredible success as a as a new club in the, in the Premiership, anyway, captain decided this the first trophy, um, and as Steno said, all of these younger lads coming through that are now blossoming. Just what what was it like coming over and playing for a club like Exeter Chiefs at that time? That was great. I'd never. Uh... In terms of the play, I'd never been to Exeter before I arrived there to play. Who's your son? You come out late. Good. Um, yeah. Yeah. There he is. Morning. Good bright. This is Alfie. Um, but the you first. Woke up yet. <laughs> hey. Alfie's not woke up yet. No, you're not waking up yet. <laughs> this is what this weird noise was coming from downstairs. Um, no, I mean the first game I played was a. Uh, was an A-League game up in uh, at Quinns. And was the first there's a couple of surprises. One that you travel uh, up to the, you caught the bus up to the game for a couple of hours and then played that night and then drove home. Then it doesn't happen. Yeah, so that was firstly surprising. But then got out on that field and knew no one really because it only come a week ago. And, but then you started looking at, you were like, I was short way. We lost that game, but you looked at the players. There was Dave Ewers and Yendel, Cowan Dickey, uh, Slade, Noel, all these guys, uh, Hilly probably as well. And you were like, these guys, were, they were young then. And they were, and you were like, shit, there is some talent here. You know, like an incredible bunch of people that have gone on, many of those to, to play over 100 games for the club. And the beauty about Exeter is they've kept them all together, uh, which is the real, the real challenge here. Because it's, if you get a growing bunch of excellent players, they obviously, as they start to grow, they, they start to earn a bit more. So it's much, much harder to keep them together. And it's been a huge credit to the, to the club and the coaches to keep that, that talent as one. Because now they've got that sort of collective, you talk about teams that get the collective knowledge of how each other play. Like they've been playing together for now 10 years. 10 or 12 years now and, and they're only sort of um, you know, in their late 20s. It's, it's rare that you get that sort of cohesion from someone that's in, the, in their 20s. So, um, you know, it's been, it's been fantastic to watch. Um, like most clubs I've played for, they do much better when I leave. So, Did you play the full game on that, in that, in that at Quinn's game? Or just half, half a game? Uh, well, I would have tried my best not to play a full game. No. Yeah, have been, I imagine that would have been a 40 minutes. Just come and sit down here, Dean. Will Carrick Smith <laughs> would have bolted off the bench thinking this was a chance. This is it. They've subbed Mumsy. Yeah. This is my moment. <laughs> <laughs> the big bloke from shoot. Yeah. The guy from, I'll, be, uh, I'll be starting the next Prem game for sure. You were probably playing the next Prem game, Mumsy, were you? Yeah, I did. I, I think we actually played Kings that weekend. I came off the bench, yeah. Straight back home from Quinns that night into training on Tuesday morning. Fair play. 
Yeah, see, I didn't sign up for that either. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, there was so much excitement when you arrived, Mumsy, because everyone lived off that YouTube clip of you uh, playing against uh, the South Africans in the handoff. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it remains my one highlight out of 12 years of playing. So, I mean, you've got to be remembered for something. And once, I'll those happily sticks, take it. once those punji sticks straighten, <laughs> it can't be broken, like, you know? <laughs> it is bloody hard. It's like when you, it's like when you glue, uh, like, many pieces of balsa wood together. It actually somehow remains strong. Yeah. <laughs> There's not much there to start with. Is it? Class, what was your first game? Trenton game. Uh, it would have been, I think it was Quinn's, uh, and I came off the bench, uh, and I, I, you know, I got in a scuffle with Danny Kerr, and I think I got Simbins. Uh, so <laughs> it was like pretty much, it was not an element like I did, I, I did give away a penalty and I got a defensive time with Simbins. So it was, not, it was kind of indicative of what happens sometimes when I played as well. Been annoyed from the Monday night to kind of travel. Monday yeah, night. That, well, that's right. I, I mean, here I was and, and signed up for a couple of years, and the night before into training the next morning. Never again though, surely that was your one and only A-League appearance. Uh, was it? Yeah. I came back from a shoulder injury, I'm not sure I played A-League or win. No, I, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good stat that, a good stat. <laughs> yeah, so In and out, surgical strike, never again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so long suckers. I, I, no, it's important to say that I experienced A-League. Mm, indeed. We all have. So that was that was the worst game you played. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that can transition us to the best game you played. Oh mate, the worst game for me was always sale on a Friday night. Like I hated that game. Uh, not nothing to do with <laughs> with playing sale. It was just always a five hour drive. Uh, it was Probably always fly, cold. Not anymore now, mate. They fly. They fly. We get there. We fly there, we get there, we're there at about three o'clock the day before, we play on the Friday night, you're there for about 26, 27 hours in hotels, they're like... Unbelievable. God, like, isn't it? One of us still do charter there. flight as well for you guys. It's yeah, and, then sometimes, and now sometimes we fly back as well. Just to, But I always liked the SEAL bus trip. That was always the best one. You know, it's about five hours, it's about the right, right length of time on a bus trip. You got two options on that bus trip, though. You buy in, don't you? So you buy in and you and you have a few beers and enjoy yourself. Or if you don't, or you've had an injury and you can't drink, then it is it is just torture because you, it's like four in the morning. You get home and you're like, yeah. you just can't, it's it's a t- yeah, it's a tough trip or the best trip depends what you make of it. And you always you always a man seen that generally made the best of things. Well, like you know, in these situations, you know, you got to make most of life. Yeah, that's right. You see, I, I, had a, I had a surreal moment yesterday when Alfie was playing some uh, okay. playing some songs <laughs> and you could hear the toilet flushing in the background. He's good. And uh, he was playing some songs yesterday and then the music band came on, like a version <laughs> of the music band came on. It was the first time I'd, I'd really heard it in years and I thought the timing was unbelievable. It didn't have so many of the same, uh, the same sort of elements as your one, but nonetheless. It's all right. As he gets older, he'll learn the real words. Brand. Yeah, maybe maybe you could do like a a, a sure, with Joe it. version of the Music Man. I have <laughs> not done the Music Man in a few years now. I don't even remember the words. But I I, 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 get, I find it funny as well. My, my my kids used to put it on as well. I felt real uncomfortable having it in the room. So hey, without the without saying. the banjo string, it's not the same thing, is it? <laughs> it certainly isn't. It's a hard thing to play that. It's a hard thing to play. <laughs> it's a tough instrument. Get dressed, Dad. It's a Wednesday morning. For <laughs> <God's sake. laughs> it's a good job. The, the boss was always blacked out windows. But. It was uh, handy, wasn't it? Except the time. I, that, that. Real good, I always remember the real good bus trip with, uh, with Carl there when we came back from Newcastle one time. We got back at like six in the morning. Yeah. That was, the, um, that was the, it was the last game of the season. Uh, and I'd, we always, before we'd made any any notable games, I, I guess it would have been like two thousand. Yeah, yeah, I remember playing out there last yeah. game. Yeah. Yeah. And they like and they that. said we're going to drive back from Newcastle, and it was just like, well, it's the last game of the season. We'll have a good time. We'll make the most of it. And it just like you say, I remember sort of like five hours into the absolute the, the piss of pisses, just literally just like having a great time, thinking, yeah, it's all right, we'll be home soon. 
was peeking out the pitch black window and just seeing a sign for like Manchester. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a brutal one. <laughs> Rolling into Sandy Park and there's just like empty cans strewn across the hall, and bodies <laughs> everywhere. It's like, this is not, this is not good. Not I good. actually got home and the kids were up for the next day. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Oh, well. Not a great time for them to see their dad, is it? My youngest one was <laughs> up. He wouldn't have been old to be very much of them. Not not much, but I remember the kids being one being up. Oh, mm, tough. Yeah. That is a true man test. We talk about man test. That's a man test. That's it is a man test. You yeah. have to pass that then. As, as, as these sort of tests, bus journeys, would that be if someone was defeated after looking out the window and seeing Manchester and just thought, no, he wasn't defeated. At no point was the man <laughs> defeated. Oh no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying if someone <laughs> had been. Yeah. Um, I think I'd agree. Any, any, any man that takes defeat on a bus trip on the last game of the season, I, I wouldn't have it. I wouldn't stand for it. He's no man. <laughs> I don't. If, no he, man. if he tried, if he, if, he, if he tried to hide himself down the front, unless he, unless we're, unless we're looking at a broken leg, he's getting pulled back up, back up to back up to where the action is. I'd say it's the last game of the season. There's nothing left. There's nothing left. Give it all. Give it your all. You know. Um, Was that the wild yeah. in terms of the journey back? Newcastle, last game of the season. Well, I mean, it, it sucked. There was a spray of cans coming out the, of the bus before any person did when you got back. <laughs> yeah, pretty much like that, yeah. It was um, sleeping on the last yeah. leg, right? Yeah, no, it was brutal. Like you say, boys just yeah, piling off, eyes blearing in the sunlight, trying to get themselves home and get their fancy dress on to get that down the blue ball for nine o'clock, I think. <laughs> like, this is going to be a tough day. But, um, See, didn't... how is it appropriate for me to go home and find a beer at eight in the morning? It's yeah. not appropriate, <laughs> but it still is. We did it you want. It's eight o'clock, isn't it? It's getting there. <laughs> yeah, you could do. Yeah. Send Alfie up to the fridge, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I'll time you, mate. I'll time you. The quicker you, you can do whistle it, the music man on the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do none of you want to sing the music man right now, then? I don't think you oh, want good. us to sing the music man right now. Huh? I don't think you want us to sing the music right. man right now. Fine, we'll, we'll, we'll admit to feet on that. I, um, I'm, not sure it's, I'm not sure it's been ever done via Zoom. So, I mean, there is an opportunity in the future, perhaps, to point. do it. Yeah. But. Well, it's something we'll look into. But, you know, um, you know I'm a father but now. If, but, but if the B, yeah, but if there's anything associated with this with the BBC, then it's probably not appropriate for it to go ahead. Okay, yeah, you got it. Fair enough. We'll leave it. Mm -hmm. um, talk us through, then, that, that, um, that first trophy win as well. Um, milestone moment. For Chiefs, obviously, they kind of made that first hurdle. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a great moment, and I think any final you can have that's at home makes it even more special, really. Um, and it was it was a bit of fortune in that, and then it was just allocated to us that year. Uh, and yeah, it was obviously something we, we went pretty hard at because we loaded up and, and had the best possible team that we could because we knew it was a, it was an important chance to get. Um, to get a trophy. Um, I don't remember much about the game, to be honest, um, except except the Northampton. Um, it was sort of, I was thinking earlier when you guys were talking about the expectation now that you win every match, is that what we, I think what we knew at that stage is that if we played well, then we could beat any team, um, as opposed to thinking that we would necessarily could win every match. Um, that we that we played in, and it's a it's a shift of mentality. But we did know New Northampton was pretty they were pretty good at that stage, uh, as that were as they are they've come back this year. But they uh, are a very good side, very strong and dominant in terms of their set piece play. And that was probably the area we struggled against them in those years. Is that we just got bashed at scrum and line out more time, and, and it's kind of reversed a little bit for the Chiefs now. So. Um, yeah, we, I, I, we did play very well that year. I remember the old boy, Kai, had, you know, he had a pretty good game. I think he got me out of the match. Uh, and then it was just it was from that moment and winning at home and, you know, it, it, was, it was special. You know, you don't, when you look back at your career, you certainly don't get big matches and big wins or finals at home very often. And so that, that presents as a pretty special one. And it was... Uh, was also to go up into the 
as you sort of come out the back there and, and where the aftermatch is and to go there and see the joy on all the Chiefs fans through that evening was was amazing. And that for me is just as memorable as what happened on you know, on the pitch is that it really did mean so much to, to Chiefs fans who had who'd held in it, had seen the yeah, had seen success with in the um, in the championship, but this was their first taste of it, I suppose, in in the premiership. So it was it was I mean, I don't know, it's fond memory for me, I suppose. I think it was definitely a milestone. Like, it definitely, um, yeah, it was just so many players stepped up and had massive games that day. Like, so yourself, Kai was genuinely, we were going to invite him on the Zoom chat, but we just thought we haven't got the time for him to really have the last five minutes of that game. Um, and then just, yeah, like people like Chris Whitehead, though, uh, Shuey had a hell of a game that day. Dolman, you know what I mean? Some big, big, big games. And it was, I think it was definitely like the point where, even though we possibly didn't finish the season that strong after that, like as strongly as we wanted to, it was still like a moment, like you say, where it was like, well, that, that proves it. We can, we can do it. And then it sort of, I guess it just helped help with the mentality. Interesting stat on that game though. Even though it was an amazing game, I had a great day, have so similar memories to yourself. There was a, I think there was two unused substitutes in that game. Was there Gareth? There was, Carl. And um, who were they? <laughs> Romana Graham. <laughs> was he? Oh, well, there was three on you. Oh, uh, <laughs> <couldn't>, uh, <laughs> yeah. We couldn't get Romana Graham on this chat. <laughs> 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 uh, no, I do. It was that. In fairness, yeah, like, it's, it's interesting how circumstance can dictate like how amazing sort of the, like I look back at that game now, and I, I am genuinely I was proud to be part of it. I really enjoyed the day. I really enjoyed the, the experience, but that, that it was an interesting five minutes when that whistle went, where it was a bit of a little bit of of saltiness in, in my in my mouth where I was just like oh, you know like you know we it's horrible you, you're like I can't I can't I can't bring the boys down that literally people are walking on cloud nine and you're just like right come on pull your head out your ass pull your head out your ass but it was a genuinely a bit of a like right luckily for me there's always been something that will um change my mindset quite quickly and that's beer so as soon as I got back to the changing room had a couple of beers in the in the in the uh, in the showers and that was it it was like I played 80 minutes but um yeah, no, it was, it was an interesting feeling. I, you must have had a similar one, Stina, where it was like, yeah, I certainly wasn't unhappy, but it was a bit like, if you haven't spilled a bit of sweat on that pitch, it, it, it doesn't really feel like it was your, 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 your win in a way, does it? Yeah, I, I've, I've experienced it now in, well, that LV Cup final. Um, yeah. Very strange, especially when you're standing there, you're squirting all the champagne around you. It's a bit, oh, we didn't really do much in that game or... Um, the other one was whenever we won the LV Cup not too long ago, a couple of seasons ago at Gloucester. I think I came on for two minutes, and it was absolutely. I was like, "I've come on, I've just got muddy," um, you know. So it, it's a strange scenario. Don't get me wrong, but I think the the way you probably got to approach it, and that's the way we're kind of trying to think about things now. I know it's obviously you're in the moment and you live it. But you kind of go, "Well, I was part of the team that prepped the team to get ready. I was part of getting that team ready for the warm up, those bits and pieces." If I contributed to fellas, hopefully feeling good for one of the feed, then you probably did contribute. But I'm fully with, like, we're all sportsmen. We all want to play. Uh, it is frustrating you don't get a run out. But probably, you know, it's like anything. You feel a bit down for a couple of minutes. But once the boys are celebrating, you're out, you know, and everybody loves a, loves a beer. Since, I think, like, time heals that. Since I've retired, like, though, that, that medal... And the medal for the first Premiership final and the medal uh, for the one after the one we won literally stayed in my sock drawer. The one we won, because I played in it, it was, that's, that's framed, it's got the shirt up. But since I've retired, <clears throat> they have been dug out the sock drawer. They are now polished. They're sitting on the mantelpiece, you know what I mean? Because there's no way I'm having them taken away, you know what I mean? I played in those seasons. I played in the games surrounding them. I've definitely, if people mm. come around my house, they're like, oh, well, you know, because you know, it's like... <laughs> You know, you, you get rid of the, the, the petulant part of it falls away, and you're just like, nah, definitely, definitely, I'm taking that. That's part of my part of my career, sort of thing. So, um, yeah. Definitely. I was going to say, though, both of you played in 2017. That win there, wasn't it, Mumsy? You had a, you you were on tour somewhere, weren't you, in New Zealand or something, watching it? Yeah, yeah, no, I was. I was in. Uh, we played in uh, Dunedin the night before. Uh, we lost because we were pretty crap that year, uh, but I stayed up. Uh, I'd start up, and I think the game was on. It must have been four in the morning or something in New Zealand, maybe. So, uh, or maybe it finished at four, maybe it started at one because it, it went for it was a long game because you had the extra time or whatever. 
and it wasn't showing on TV. So here I was, yeah, had my phone, just like looking here, roommate was asleep in the dark while I just watched on my phone was plugged into the wall. So you know when your phone's plugged into the wall, but you can only really be like as far as your cord is away as well. So it was a pretty uncomfortable couple of hours, except for when, when you won. Yeah, like it was, it was amazing. It was amazing to watch. The roommate was woken up. Interestingly, we had an email from Colin, Dean, about this, similar to what Steve was kind of just saying there, and, and with Carl. Given that you had kind of left the club, was it two years before then? Was there any sort of like, ah, could, could I just hang on for a couple of years, being part of that squad that went on to win the... Win you did, well, you know, I probably... You did all right, probably, Dean. You did all right, mate. Right? You did all right, mate. You played, yeah, yeah. You played no, a pretty no, big no. game after. <laughs> yeah. No, it was, yeah, there was moments of worth leaving, but I, 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 as I sort of was joking before, the same sort of happened to me at, at the Waratahs. When I left the Waratahs, they also won uh, two years after, and I'd sort of been involved in finals and a few games with them. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you, you, if you play for a club, you be, you're a fan of the club, you know? So, like, and particularly the Chiefs, I, I didn't, I certainly didn't leave and tried not to leave any any club I left to with any animosity or feeling that you and uh, enjoyed your time there. I, I lo- absolutely adored my time in Exeter and I, I would have stayed if it wasn't for trying to do something else, you know. So, um, yeah, I was, I was, I was so pumped for, for the boys, for you guys that were part of it that, uh, you know, I remember, you guys probably don't remember it, but Adam Rubin, the team doctor, FaceTimed me. It's sort of kind of I was at breakfast the next morning, and you, I did see a little bit of the bus time, uh, and Rubes came up the back, and it was pretty, uh, it was awesome, and so that was kind of enough for me to feel a part of it, and yeah, that's all probably I deserve for me because it's you guys that did the hard work to, to get it done. Are you, are you at all surprised that Chiefs have gone on to this sort of thing then since you, since you went away? No. Not at all, no. Um, I mean, the, the, when you look at good teams around the world, they have a, an excellent, they have stability. Right? So Exeter's got this great stability with its, uh, its governance, so with Tony Rowe and off the field. Very, you know, a lot of continuity there. So people know what they're doing. And then also with their coaching staff, because they've been together for, for 10 years and they've enjoyed success, it's sort of, Super stable. So anyone, and also with the leadership of the team. So having Steno there across all that time, Dolly as well, uh, you know, Hayden, Thomas, and, and sort of even sort of Kai and others sort of still in and around the club. There's this sort of, again, this continuity of culture that happens as well. So none of that's particularly changed. And the people that go there love it and, and continue to love it. And I think it goes to say that the culture drives. And if the culture's right, you can you can do whatever you whatever you you know whatever you possibly can, and, and you sort of maximise your talent. And I think that's what Exeter does. When people go and play for Exeter, they play the best they do throughout their careers. Mumsy, one of the things I get when I, when we we sign players from your neck of the woods in Australia, and that, that that when you start talking to them immediately, the thing that comes across is that they like the old school mentality, which suits an Aussie. With the in a professional world, uh, yeah, that's a, a huge thing for them. All the lads, you know, uh, Dave Dennis, uh, Lockie, uh, Greg Holmes, whoever it is, you know, the Aussie boys really buy into to the Chiefs. Was it like that for you? Oh, totally. Uh, yeah, and that's yeah. When when if I was when I spoke to Denar about going over, it's like uh, <laughs> that's the fun, you yeah, know. Like it's it, playing playing professional sport. If you if you if you Get stuck in the bubble, and it is a bubble in there. Particularly, you realise when you when you leave it, uh, is it's almost sterile. You kind of lose touch with sometimes. You know, I, you know, I certainly found here in Australia on occasion I'd lose touch with why you were playing the game, uh, which is you're playing the game because you loved it when you were younger, and this is an opportunity to do what you love on a full time basis. So you start if you move yourself away from that 100 percent focus on performance and sort of re-engage with why you're playing the game, then it's a lot more rewarding. And in Exeter, that balance is right. So that performance focus is, 
is necessarily there. So when you come up, you turn up every day and you train, you train hard, but then you have fun with, with, with the squad, which is important. Squad, fun with the squad's encouraged, which is not always. Uh, and that's not just you know, getting on the, on the beers, it's, it's other things, it's embracing and, and doing sort of having um, socials, whether it's on or off the, uh, the booze, but it's, it's also the interaction with the community in there that makes it special. So you, you're always reminded, you're always engaged with, with, what you, with what you're playing for, which is important. Well, St Stino and Steve-O and Carl, I suppose, as well, bit of uh, blowing smoke up Dean's trumpet here, but when he, um, when he signed, obviously an Australian international coming in, what, what, what was the kind of feeling? You know, was it like, Jesus, we, we've, got a, we've got a great player coming in here? It was, it was very exciting times. Just like, whenever we were playing championship rugby, you know, we were just aspiring to be premiership rugby players. We didn't, we didn't have any internationals near us. We didn't have anybody close to being an international player at that stage. And to be, I think Tom Johnson ended up in the first year that um, we were in the Prem, he went and he got capped. And then all of a sudden we started hearing about like Sorelli Nakalabuki was coming all of a sudden. And that was a big name for us as well. But I think Dean coming from Australia, one of the top nations um, in, in the world game, with whatever it was, 30, 40 caps you had at that stage, Dino. And the next thing, you're, you're, you're wanting to come to extra Chiefs. Like, there was a real general buzz of, like, when, when's this guy coming? You know, we're very excited about him coming in. And I'm sure you probably came and thought there was a lot of pressure on you. Um, and, but the, the thing was, you know, the, the perfect thing was, Dean talked there about the culture of the club. He came in, he bought, a, bought into it straight away. Now, we didn't normally traditionally sign what you would class as superstars, but Dean would have been classed as a superstar in those day and age. And for him to come in and just to generally fit into the way of life of Chiefs showed that we had something that worked. And the reason that, you know, the, the things that Dean's talking about there and the reason why obviously he came in and enjoyed it was he bought into it straight off the bat because he was that type of a guy. And the reason he came to the extra Chiefs was because he fitted the bill and he fitted into what we were about. And that's why we were successful together. And that's why, now, as a club, whenever we do start to sign players, first and foremost, yes, you have to be a good rugby player, but ultimately, you need to be a good bloke. And that's mm -hmm. the main thing whenever it comes to, if we want to go to war with one another, you want to be, you want to be friends with a bloke beside you. You're not going to go and fight with a deck like So that's basically the kind of way we've seen it. And when Dean came in, I'm sure Carl and everyone will say the exact same thing. You know, it was very exciting times because everyone was super excited when he got here. I, I turned up the same year as Dean, and uh, this is, is kind of a testament to where how Exeter deals with 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 its in-house policing of of, uh, of talent. Is the first away game we ever went on together back in the days before the bus was any good. I literally got on the bus, and I was uh, I think it was my first away game, definitely yours. And we both sat on that little broom cupboard seat next to the toilet <laughs> on the way up. <laughs> we hadn't we hadn't been there long enough yet to actually get a seat of our own. So just like yeah. we sort of sat huddled in this little, this crappy little seat next to the shitters, just like that. So, um, yeah. We were, regardless yeah. of who it was, we were lucky <laughs> Sino spoke to us at that stage, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. He was back in the bus, back at the back of a bus, very comfortable <laughs> yeah. seat, probably still in the same seat, to be honest. I have the same seat, yes. It's now in the yeah. middle. Looking back, I can look both ways. Yeah, well, there you go. Good idea. I always Very thought, wise. Uh, I was always uh, I've always had the hooker is always beside me. I've always had Simon Olcott was my first one, then I've got Yendel, who's now beside me now. So sorry. I'd like you. Sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if ever if ever there was a chance to break from tradition, you should have moved me. That was <laughs> 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 I'm oh, cooped it. It's all right. I get on the bus and we we do our quiz and then I put my film on. No, that's my time I can watch a film. So one day, yeah, yeah, one day, the problem yeah. with the endo is you get, you get, if it's a sunny day, you get glare off that E. You know, it's not good. It's, uh -huh, oh, it's sunny's on as well. I can't believe Yendel's never realised you've just been staring at a blank screen for three hours. Just like <laughs> 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 yeah. And welcome, Jack Yendel. Um, see, see. All right, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> Put the film on, Steve. Yeah. Since, uh -huh. um, since you finished. Uh, with rugby and actually kind of before as well when you when you were still over here involved with the Bourne um, 
Foundation doing these incredible things. We were kind of chatting before we started recording about your, your trek to the North Pole. I mean, mm. hardest thing you've ever done? Best thing you've ever done? Uh, no, to be honest. Uh, the, oh, I don't want to be down on but the hardest thing was, was sort of going through all the elements that led me towards Bourne. So, yeah, you know, Sarah and I have lost four children now just because they were born too soon. So we lost two in in Exeter, so uh, Sophie and Henry. Um, so that, I mean, that that was, it pales into comparison, the difficulty as opposed to doing a trek. And so the, you know, <laughs> in a certain extent, I, I feel like I'm fortunate in a way that those sort of things have led me to doing these treks and raising money because there's so many families out there that experience uh, premature birth and and struggle with uh, the loss that comes with that, the loss or the ongoing disability that don't get to do the exciting things that I got to do. So actually, I always knew that physically it was going to be pretty challenging, but I knew that uh, that sort of my why, my reason to go do that was pretty strong. So. You know, as long as physically I was able, you'd find a way to get through, I think. Mm. Mm. Fair play. Go on, Carl. No, I was going to say fair play to you. Like you say, it's a yeah, great opportunity to do something, make the best out of a horrible situation. So, good. Yeah. Mm. Uh, anyway, the, <laughs> I can go more into the trek if you'd like. <laughs> well, if, you, if you'd like. back up a bit. <laughs> we, we did have, we did have, Carl's got the questions in front of him as well, but we had a couple come in about about it basically kind of because it, it's something so alien to everybody that, that is from you know the rest of the world basically to think that you're going out for a week or so just trekking through freezing conditions so we just yeah yeah well i mean it is it, alien's a good word for it because you really do feel like you get dropped off in in your other in another world and you sort of sort of you sort of leave uh London and you catch a flight, you go through Oslo, we stayed a night there and then went up to a place called Longyearbyen, which is sort of the world's most northern town, to sort of the archipelago that comes off uh, Norway. And it, uh, it, it, it's, it's sort of minus 10 by the time you get there, there's reindeer walking through the middle of the town. It, you sort of like, you go back many, many decades in, in sort of your progression. And then from there, you take another two hour flight you take a flight in this little Antonov uh, Russian cargo plane where you enter the door like you know when we were playing, you take a little right, you know, there's a little sort of galley there, and then you go out the back and there's three rows of seats before the open-ended cargo. Uh, there's no wall, you know, it's just, you know, that, that, thing, that thing drops and everything falls out the back of it. So it's, uh, that, that's sort of you start to get a sense of what you're doing is a little bit different. And then when you land, then you land on, um, this place called Barneo, which is just a temporary camp that the Russians set up every year, or not every year, they couldn't do it last year, uh, on the ice. And you land on this ice runway and then they crack open that door and they crack open that cargo hold and the air just rushes at you. And then you wander outside, but that stage you had a beard and you're, and the, the moment you hop out, your breath freezes to your beard and everything starts to crackle and you know, move and it's sort of minus... 25 by the time you hit there and you're like right I we're in and then that stage you're only on the we're on the underground for about 40 minutes we hop out of the plane and our, our guy goes right oh, well we've got we've got the first exit so we're out and so we'll get straight to this helicopter another massive Russian helicopter you, know, you can sort of fit 16 people in plus all of these big sleds you come with so these are big bits of kit and then so two hours after you know sort of Three, three or four hours after you've left this sort of semi-comfort of Longy Barn, you're, you're getting dropped off on an ice sheet in the middle of nowhere and you're huddled up. And as that helicopter leaves, you're like, what am I in for here? <laughs> what have I signed up for? Because it starts to get pretty real. Uh, and then you just, you know what? You, you, put your, uh, you put your GPS towards north and then you crack on. And like that's kind of as simple as it is. And then... Uh, you really are in the hands of your, of, your, of your guides in a certain extent because they're setting, you know, the course. The course is always north, 
Uh, and then when he feels like you've done enough Ks that day and you, and you found a, a chunk of ice that's firm enough to sleep on, then you, you pack up for the day. So Is it's it, kind how, of... Uh, how tough was it? Hey? How physically, how tough is it in those conditions? Yeah, it's pretty... Uh, yeah, it's solid. It's pretty solid. It's, it's, it's tricky, I think. Uh, I, I had I remember this moment where I you put your sled on and we came across to our first bump, you know. So I I never really cross country skied before, neither have I since, to be honest. But um, and then you, you're just finding your way. You come across this bump and you lean into it. And you've got your you got a forty kilo pack on the back of you, and that first bump's going to tell you whether that pack's going to be lighter than you think or it's going to be heavier. And I sort of leaned my way into it. And I was like, and then it starts to move a bit easier than I thought. I was like, well, pleasingly, my training had, had paid off, you know, pulling a tyre up and down a beach here in Australia. Um, so physically, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty challenging. You can't, it's, it's difficult. So I was speaking to a guy up there and he said it's the world's, yeah, for example, it's the world's biggest obstacle course because all you do is set your course north and you come across, so the, you, you just go ice, iceberg, they're called flows, but you go iceberg to ice. Iceberg. And basically, they either pull apart and, and you can form open water, or they come together and it's called a pressure ridge. And you just find a way around them, whatever you do. And then once you get around them, even if you come off course, then you sit course north and keep going again. So, really, you have no idea what you're going to come across. So, it's tricky in the front. Some, some stage, you're walking across cracked ice, still with your sled on you, with skis on. And if you, you know, you thought a camel was awkward before, think about a camel on skis across cracked ice, you know, like it is particularly awkward. So, uh, yeah, you, you do fall over and things like that. But, you know, you've got, if we had 10 other people going with us, it's all, and yeah, you're doing it for a great reason, you always find a way through. Incredible. I can imagine doing it. Insane. How many, how many yeah. camels? Do you know? Man, it wasn't that long. It was, uh, it was only about 60. 70 k and it took us about four to four or five days to do it. So uh, the distances are massive. So in terms of endurance stuff, but it's more than yeah, it's cold. So. Damn cold. Yeah, it is. You do. Uh, I mean, you just the other thing is once you're once you're up and running for the day, you don't you stop for only stop for about five minutes at a time, five ten minutes, and you're out for eight to ten hours at a go. So because it's too cold to stop. You know, once you stop, you have your a little bit to eat, then you you want to get going again because it's too bloody cold to stop. So much much have you raised for for that charity? Then? Uh, <clears throat> I think from that trip we raised about seven hundred thousand uh, pound for the charity, uh, and then I, uh, Sarah, and I have set up a, an armament vehicle born HMRI, which raises funds for Australian researchers to contribute to a global solution. And we've raised about. Uh, about close to four hundred thousand dollars for that. So like, well we'll, we'll keep going. Yeah, marvelous. Well done. And then, what other things have, have, have been done? I noticed that you uh, had to cancel the. Was it over in Costa Rica when you were doing? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're meant to go across Costa Rica in uh, in last week of March into April this year, which is um, it's going to be. You're going to basically traverse countries. So start with your feet in in. The Pacific Ocean end up with your feet in the, in the Atlantic, so that was going to be cool. It was about two hundred, you know, about two hundred and fifty k's, uh, and maybe a bit more, two hundred and seventy. But you do it was, it was multidisciplinary, so you do most of it on mountain bike. But you do a bit of paddling, um, do a bit of hiking through the jungle. So that's just been postponed. We'll do that again. Uh, hopefully, oh, it's about Easter next year. We're going to go if um, if everything opens up. How long does it take you to train that? Train for that, sorry. Uh, I sort of gave myself a couple of months, and uh, I suppose the sad thing is that I was probably getting to the stage I was happy to go from a training point of view. Although I hadn't done that, I, I hadn't yet been on a mountain bike properly, you know, mountain bike track. So I wasn't really that well trained. But <clears throat> I'd done a couple of months' work, um, and then we'll, I, I probably will do the same. I'll probably just start uh, maybe after New Year's and it's three months or so if you sort of stick at it uh, well enough can get you can get you in reasonable shape it's sort of taking yourself and what you what you as a rugby athlete is quite you're a short athlete yeah you know, like you, you do short efforts so you're looking at stuff you know up to a minute maybe a couple of minutes if you're particularly 
um, weird, I suppose, because uh, you just don't need to go for that long. Um, but you know, here you're looking at how do you push yourself out over um, an hour or a couple of hours, and um, you either train really long and go multiple hours, or you do um, a little bit. You just go harder for, for, for you know, an hour or so, like that. and that's kind of the way. It's like. Charlie, out of interest, because I've got those questions in front of me. Yeah. Could you, could you enlighten us all as to who asked that question and, and how it's pronounced? Um, yeah, I can. Let me just get it up on my phone. How would, just before you go, how would you, how would you pronounce a name spelled A-O-I-F-E? So I know how it's pronounced. I thought you would, Stino. So now I was yeah, gonna... I thought it sounded possibly Celtic or something like that. I'd, I'd, all I can get in my head, though, is weef. <laughs> so the question, yeah, was about the tracks, wasn't it? So, yeah. Stino, do you want to guess? A-O-I-F-E? Weef. Weef. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be weef. It can't be weef, honestly. Ovi. Say it again, Dean. To our Irish expert, to, uh, uh, is it? I would say, is it? I don't know. Have them too long, boys. Too long, too long. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. You've let me. You have let me down here, Gareth, because I would have thought right. it's it nailed on. What you said, you can pronounce it. Go on. Yeah, it's Efa. Efa. Yeah. I'm so glad it's not Weef. I showed you how good my phonics is with my home schooling. He's basically English now anyway, aren't you, mate? Yeah, mate, yeah. English boys, <laughs> mate, yeah, two English boys. I don't think you need to promote that, Gareth. That ship has sailed. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, have not, I have not announced my international. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably retire internationally if you wanted. It's up to you. <laughs> no, I'm still available. I'm still available. Eddie Jones, get your eyes peeled. Get in there. Get in there, mate. Um, seeing as though we've, we've asked a couple of questions then, um, mastermind Carl Rimmer, do you want to go through a couple more? Uh, well, yeah, I, I kind of forgot to do it, but, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, the first one is an interesting one. I don't even know. It just says, it's from Colin and it said, who had the worst hair while you were Exeter's captain, Dean? <laughs> oh, hitting. What a niche question. No, I think he's probably, he's got someone in mind by asking that question, doesn't he? I don't know. I mean, I mean, ultimately, the worst hair was, was probably Jack Yandel. I mean, he doesn't have hair. Yeah. So. I mean, that's a fair answer because, yeah, I mean, it doesn't get any worse than having none. But, yeah. There, I mean, to be fair, there was... You a can few think. I mean, I mean, you guys can think as well. I mean... Uh, there was a few I mean, knocking you've got to think. Maybe you've got to think someone like Hayden, who... Yeah, yeah Rat, Rat was still pretty much holding on to his hair by that yeah. stage. He hadn't quite... He was it did he go... Did he... Did he, he shaved it at your house, didn't he? Uh, he yeah. did. He shaved it at my birthday party. Wasn't that after that LV win? Oh, that's yeah, that, was, that was after. That was after. It was Jesse, my and Jesse's birthday with a third. Yeah, but it, it was after the bus parade for the oh, LV oh, game, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. So I, he had, was... I had. Um, I remember walking into my garage and Sorelli Nakalavudi, Sorelli Nakalavugi and Romana Graham sitting on an esky having a cider with Tony Rowe. <laughs> yeah, in full suit. In full yeah, suit, full suit yeah. at yes. about <laughs> four or five o'clock in the afternoon, and yeah, drinking, drinking out of their Dartington crystal <laughs> cups they just got off the mare. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant, there. Yeah, we had, uh, yeah, Hayden, Hayden shaved his head that day, and he, we all thought he was Charlie Hodgson, and we all ran around yeah, saying, yeah, right. Charlie, Charlie, kick us a goal. Uh, he was, 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 Dolman, Dolman been hanging on in there for years as well. Uh, yeah, Dolman. I mean, Dolman, I still hate, he still hates a wet, a wet day, you know, a wet night yeah. with sort of uh, lights coming from above. It's not nice. A few of them, few of them have done it well this year, like Pods has, has uh, took the shave and um, Mooney. But I think it is the best Steve thing. Townsend, to... Steve Townsend's the one with the haircuts at the moment. Yeah. If it's going, I think it is, the best thing is to just tackle it while you're young. I mean, we all joke at Yendel, but he just he just he just made the decision at the age of eighteen, <laughs> and uh, and and has lived with it, you know. Yeah, to be honest, Stewie Townsend should probably go that way, shouldn't he? Yeah, I think he's, so. He's looked, he, I mean, he's looked like Kai since he was eighteen, <laughs> and uh, it's not it's not great because Kai, Kai clearly is not eighteen. You know? No, clearly. Yeah. So, so are you saying the worst hair is no hair because? 
I mean, I'm, I'm probably uh, going into, into trouble here, but some of Jack Knowles' cuts have been a little bit. He's done a Mr. T now. Have you seen that? Yeah. He's always had this uh, incredible ability to, I don't know, not care and be nonchalant about it. So it, sort of, it gives you nowhere to go with it. You know, when you, you, know, when you come in and, and you get a little nibble and you, you can pick at it and you can go and you can, you, can make it, you can make it something. But when you come in and say something and he's just like, yeah, I know, I like it. It just it leaves you stranded. You have got nowhere to go. Yeah, with it. So, it may like the D- Dicky has had some genuinely horrible haircuts. Yeah, as well. but he's completely uh, aware of it. And, it, and yeah, yeah, but he, yeah, but he, yeah, he, he, he doesn't care. Well, and so it's in the family. Wait. Ben White had a great lid. Oh, oh, that would be a hell of a shout, actually. Yeah, there you go. It'd be remiss of me not at least to put some sort of barb into Ben White at this. Well, yeah, yeah. Ben yeah. White decided that he would grow his hair for a year. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, he can't grow all of his hair because it's you got a massive biscuit at the back of it. <laughs> it was just pure Sideshow Bob. <laughs> <laughs> he was Sideshow Bob, though, really. <laughs> yeah, that was a fair shout. Fair shout. <laughs> um, um, question, Colin. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Good uh, conversation started, Colin. Well done. Uh, I mean, the Samson, aged eight. Um, which player you've played against would you most like to see signed for the Chiefs? Not a bad question. Not a bad question at all for a young eight-year-old man. Yeah. Uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, I think, man, Samson. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I, I mean, I always enjoyed playing with someone that... I, I mean, I suppose if like, I love playing against and uh, with someone that could really flick a game with someone like Ma Nonu. You know, someone that, uh, and I don't know if Samson would have really been on the track with Martin, I know at eight, but he you know, should go back and watch some YouTube clips because that bloke could break apart a game like, like no one else I could see. Um, and he, you know, he was fortunate enough to have someone like Dan Carter and Conrad Smith outside him, but he was, he really could just uh, in a matter of moments. And if I played you know, a few games against him, where he, you'd, think you'd, have, you'd think you'd have them covered, whatever it was, Hurricanes or all blacks and he would just snap and he would change it and then the game was gone and you know that was that was his ability so i think if you're going to add into the balance of the chiefs did he score that try against you in the final yeah yeah we were we were in good shape well that and that and dan carter's 55 meter drop goal you know like these these two moments that are just sort of supreme skill but you know like we were i i felt you know, back into that into that final that we'd had them. We were we had momentum on them. We got within four points. We were flying. Everything was going our way. And then it, that period of time, like we defensively had them in pressure. Not only just takes a ball, takes a pass, steps a couple, scores under the post, game done. Like that's what he can do. And I think if if you look at the balance of the way the Chiefs work, you know, like having sort of someone that could really open that up in the midfield would be would be awesome. Yeah, I don't know if he's. Um, I don't. Uh, yeah, I never played mine on him, but uh, I don't know if he'd fit in completely. I never met the guy for Adam, but someone I truly, truly hated playing was that Sonotti, Sonotti bloke. Oh, yeah. Literally, the, the again, probably not the same level of of continuous class as Manonu, but when he wanted to, my Christ, could he play? Could he do some business, some damage? Literally, like I've seen him. I've seen him go through our team, one of the best defensive the leagues, like eight people trailing in his wake. And it's just like, that's a, that's a really awkward video review with Rob. Because you know <laughs> Rob's quite, uh, he's quite matter of, he's quite matter of fact. And he's very much just like, look, why has no one got a shot on this guy? And I'm just like, Rob, we've tried. <laughs> the, the bike's wearing a like, That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, he's, he's big. Yeah, he's like a pretty puff of smoke going off in front of you. And then he appears behind you. I don't know. So, um, yeah, he, he could have done some damage, I reckon, if, he, if he'd found his way down there. Yeah, the other one's Gonova. I mean, Gonova was like that too, yeah. isn't he? I'm his prime. Mm. Yeah, unbelievable. Definitely. Definitely. Never been, never really needed too many wingers at the Chiefs. So always been quite strong in depth there. So, it's, uh, yeah, but who knows? Anyway, um, question-wise, I believe <laughs> we've, we've definitely covered the North Pole. Unless you've got some Twitter questions, I'm, I'm out of questions there. We've had weefs. <laughs> we've had Connors. Um, oh no, we actually haven't. But it was very much about. Uh, well, I'll give you a bit. It's, I'll, I'll read it out because it's nice. Dean, you were my favourite player at the Chiefs. How much do you miss the club and the city? 
And we very, we very much covered that, but now you know he was, you were his favourite player at the Chiefs. So. Who's that from? Dean. Oh, Connor. Yeah, Connor. Ooh. Hyphen. And then he started mm. the question with Dean. My bad. Connor. <laughs> Not Connor Dean. <laughs> Connor, oh, Connor Dean. Oh, we can <laughs> I tell you what, it's one thing Carl can do, and it's going to make a moment awkward, and he still excels at it without <laughs> What I do, what I do. Yeah, he is. The, the puffer fish is now blowing Are you going to answer Connor Dean's question? Or? <laughs> oh, yeah, like, Connor, thank you. I appreciate uh, I appreciate that. Uh, no, I, I do. I mean, there are, there are heaps of elements we miss. Exeter you can't well. miss the weather over in the West Country, surely. No, not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> Like I'd say it was 11, but it is still a beautiful uh, blue sky day here and probably will be a pretty nice day, even though it's, um, yeah, like it, we're, we're coming into the coldest, our coldest day of the year and it's going to be 19 here. So, yeah, that's, you don't get that in the... In the Dean, in I, Dean the I've got a question for you. What about the state mm. of Oz rugby at the moment? It doesn't look that great from this side of the, the water. How, how is it? being reported back home and, and are players or former Wallabies like you worried? Because I saw the captains uh, made a big uh, letter the other day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I am worried. Uh, I'm still on the a board of the Players Association here uh, and I was, you know, I spent uh, a couple of weeks with those guys dealing with what a pay cut should look like um, for the whole squad and that our, you know, our players ended up taking uh, a 60% pay cut, you know, and, and the financial elements of the game that we're, we're not in a good place at all. Um, and, you know, there, there's, there's a, there is a real chance that, that the game could come into some sort of, uh, to a stage financially where it's, it's not viable anymore. So it's, uh, yeah, it's not in a good state, but also it's not in a good state from, a, from an engagement from the, the public. So, Whilst participation numbers for kids playing is still good, the people turning up to, to watch games is low, the people watching t on TV is low. And yeah, it hasn't helped the Wallabies uh, haven't been as successful as we would have liked for the last couple of years, particularly in the World Cup, uh, you know, getting, uh, getting beaten sort of quite comprehensively in the end by England, you know, having 40 points put you know, to finish your, your World Cup campaign is a, is a disappointing way to go out. But I think there's... Uh, you know, I like to be optimistic about. It. I think there's a huge opportunity. I think we've, we've finally got a good, we've got a really good bunch of young players who made the final of the twenties last year. There's a great bunch of young players about to, to come through and hit the ranks. Now I've got Dave Rennie as a coach, um, Scotty Wiseman, who was assistant for the uh, for England, and then Matt Taylor, who is working with Rennie at Glasgow. They're now your national coaches, and Scott Johnson, who did a good job when he was at uh, Scottish rugby, overseeing it all. The, the, the structure's there now, but you know, like I was saying about um, Exeter, you need to have that off-field stability to be able to also do it, and that's probably the element we don't necessarily I remember, have. I remember when so, I came over and saw you in 2016, that I was totally shocked how, how rugby union is seen over there. It's like your fifth sport, isn't it? You've got ARL and mm. Aussie rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and even what we call football soccer over there, were all ahead of it, weren't they? Pretty much, yeah. We're, we're not, uh, you know, probably when I was growing up and, and the team was doing well in the sort of late 90s, 2000s, we would have been number three sport, definitely, if not pushing for number two. Uh, you know, AFL wasn't as strong there. Rugby league's come a long way. But AFL is definitely number one sport, um, cricket in summer. And then rugby is, is, is down the line. And uh, we've sort of been sliding down that route for, for a bit. So, no, it's not, it's not a big sport as well, but there are a, a core group of people who are very passionate about it. And I still think, I still think we can put together a cracking wallaby side. We've just got to have the infrastructure. And, and to be honest, just a personal view, but I think Super Rugby is probably, you know, it's, it's definitely ain't what it used to be either. So and it's, a, it's a heavy, it's a cost. It's costly to do if you've got to fly teams business class to South Africa throughout the year, it's uh, it's expensive competition and, and maybe there's a there's a better way for us to do it, keep it a bit more local, keep it in the Pacific. Well, what do you think this pandemic's gonna to do to us in terms of super rugby? 
Well, I actually think it'll do interesting. I think it'll do a bit to all international sporters. People will look about how they can get a similar result for less money. I think, uh, and I think from Super Rugby, I think the key for us is that we're in a region that's got New Zealand. Uh, obviously, for us, we've got Japan at sort of same time zone. Time zone. Um, in Super Rugby, I think that when you used to playing games in the middle of the night in South Africa or in Argentina doesn't make for a very good watching. And if, if your money's going to have to TV, you're probably sadly going to have to get games that are in your own time zone, which for us means in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, or, or, the, or the Pacific Islands. So that's, that's where I'd like to see it go. Um, I, would, I don't know what's going to happen with this pandemic and how we're going to come out of it, but I think there's probably a preference to start to get some test footy back on. Um, but yeah, Australia and New Zealand are both doing pretty well on the on the virus front. So if the first border for us to open will be the one with New Zealand. So it'd be awesome to see some Bledisloe matches this year. Is there actually um, is there any talk of when sport actually might restart? Yeah, rugby league here has been uh, pretty ambitious, and in the media they've they've put out twenty eighth of May, so you know, well, first of May here they'll you know well, first of May here in Australia they they're, they're going to go in twenty eight days time. So they're going to have fans. Uh, hey, will they have fans in the stadium? No, no. It's I mean I mean all the sports are trying to get back because that's where the money comes from, isn't it? Yeah, from TV. I and mean, also, who's not starved of a bit of sport to watch at the moment? You, you watch anything. Um, so they, they, they're saying they get back. I think rugby will probably look to get back into June, maybe early July. Is kind of the plan here. You see, well, we were meant to have. I, I ended up watching Carl's video of him kicking a football about four times. He put on. <laughs> I am definitely starved. Um, just yeah. on, on that behind closed doors thing, because if if uh, rugby league going to start it over there, it's a massive topic here with all sports basically. Football especially is, is saying, well, we want to restart it behind closed doors. As people who have played in front of pretty much a packed stadium at St- Sandy Park every single week, what would you want to play a game of rugby with with no fans in the ground? Well, if you've played A League, you you probably you prepared <laughs> you prepared. I know. I'd say, <laughs> I'd say even if you played at Bajeski Stadium, you've, you've pretty much done it anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've, it would. I mean, I, I can't. I'm not still playing, so I have no idea. I think you'd you would you'd rather not, if you know what I mean. But you, as in, you'd rather not. You, sorry, I came out wrong. You'd rather play the game than not play the game. But, yeah, exactly. but at the same time, yeah, you'd obviously rather have the fans there. It's going to be a, a really weird feeling scoring a try in a in a big Premiership game and just having no one cheer except your own bench. <laughs> so, we've yeah. uh, we've done uh, in pre season two twice now. We've had. Um, in house games, the murder ball, the murder ball yeah. you're referring to. Murder, yeah, we've done it for the two, like 20 minutes, 20 minutes. So there has been a, a game as such, and it is bizarre. It is definitely bizarre whenever somebody scores, and it's the guys that were injured who weren't playing or were sitting in the stands were clapping and cheering. But um, you know, it is a very. It, it would feel like a training session, maybe a bit. I don't really know what it'd be like playing against an opposition. But it is definitely bizarre. Even when we train at Sandy Park, we train on the main pitch. Um, and it, it's it's a strange freedom when you're running around there and there's nobody there. It would be an interesting, it would be amazing to see, like you say, that as a spectacle, what that would look like on telly. And also whether the level of performance would go down because you do feed off the energy in the crowd. You do feed off of sort of... Mm. It would always be a leveller for both teams, yeah. wouldn't it? It would be irrelevant whereas it's home or away. Mm. Yeah. We'll pipe some music in from the stand, yeah. into the stands. Well, whenever tries are scored. <laughs> tries, sounds. We can do sound effects. Yeah. Still be straight. Yeah, got it sorted. Yeah. Have the tomahawk chop just played on loop the whole the whole way through a game. That's the other thing. Would you play on that when you run out? Yeah. Steve? What's that? Would you play all the songs when you run out? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Exactly. Just get on, mate. Just get on it. Yeah. It'd literally, it'd literally be like getting the knock on the door in the tin sheds back in back when you were playing like, <laughs> like that. Oh, yeah. mate, there's no, there's no point running out past the uh, on the Put fast line. Put your back down. Still no time for the game, mate. Come on, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was actually chatting to the the guys from BT Sport, uh, one of the guys that that works for them, and um, they're already coming up with weird and wacky ideas, which include like 
robotic camera so you have no cameramen in the grounds or anything um yeah What's players that? wearing gopros we don't about that but How about that eh? the lifeline drone footage yeah <laughs> i think it's i definitely want to see it happen because for the main reason is that exeter have got a squad that can handle it and I, you just don't want to, to win the league with an asterisk next to it, do you? You want to, you want to, you want to win it one way or another, and I hope they get the chance to do that conclusively, rather than rather than have it sort of fizzle away. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if it even happened, I mean, you're gonna have to find a Twickenham. Like, it yeah. sort of, it kind of defeats the point. Yeah, like it's more expensive to open, so you may as well have it at the local park if no one's gonna be there anyway. <laughs> yeah. As long as you can film it, let's go for it. Yeah. It'd be like it'd be weirder in a bigger stadium, empty. Yeah. It would be in a smaller one. I tell you what, it has done. It's uh, it's completely and utterly. And I know this is a really flippant comment, but it's scuppered our plans of doing a um, a standoff live, Carl, from south of France in Marseille, hasn't it? It has. It, it really, really has. And obviously, it's a much graver situation than that out there right now. But that is that is a real threat of that never happening. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. No. It was. Yeah. Small sacrifice. I've, I've seen I've seen Carl had a set of budgie smugglers in the south of France. And it is, <laughs> no one knew that. No one was no one was agreeing to that. But um. <laughs> I hear that was a few years ago. That was before this pandemic. That's yeah, true. It's true. You, you're coming out of hibernation too now. <laughs> we don't know actually whether you're wearing a pair of budgie smugglers right now. I could well be. That, but, that's uh, the beauty uh, of these meetings. Yeah. No, yeah. All of it. Anyway, what's the plans then for tomorrow uh, or the rest of today, Dean? What's on the agenda? Anything? I mean, I normally it's seven thirty. I normally start work at seven thirty here. I sort of do shifts as we go uh, through the day. Is, is one of us either has to handle homeschooling a four year old or a brand new baby? So that's uh, that's the go for me. Um, I've got to work. Those two. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's handy. My, and my wife, uh, she works for the Australian Olympic Committee, and so the, she's actually gone back to work because there's plenty to do at the Olympics at the moment. Is that sort of gets shifts and moves as well? So um, that's it. That's our plan today. Another day of, of surviving, um, surviving homeschooling. It's strange new world we live in. Sadly, no one's got a good answer for that question at the moment. Have they? No. <laughs> right. Steve, I'm, 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 I'm planning that video you were talking about with the football. I'm planning on moving that back about six six more feet and seeing if I can hit the triceratops again. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need to post this video, Carl. If you want to start a challenge, I'll tell you, get 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 your kid's best airflow ball. Find yourself a target and then just just go for it. I'm deadly honest, that was two attempts. I was, that, that was top bins all day as well. I absolutely nailed it. I'll uh, I'll put it out on social media. Yeah, good good curl. But um, yeah, that that's probably what I'll do tomorrow. Um, not all not all heroes wear capes, do they, Carl? No, uh, yeah. I, what I'm what I did there is I, I I went for a sort of curling effort. You sort of um, your David Beckham esque. What I might do tomorrow is put it right at the top of the garden and go for a proper like Dietmar Harmon drill like see if i can see if i can smash it right down the middle of the garden and knock the triceratops <laughs> over just be, care, just be careful you don't put it over the fence car no, it's, a, it's a very real threat to live gareth but you know <laughs> varieties i've got i've got to spice the life up at the moment so risk how crazy work. you've always been crazy car yeah risk reward, car. the issue being i won't be able to knock on the door and ask for my ball back <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the risk yeah yeah, so really is a risky game. Anyway, that's my tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? My tomorrow is, is, is yeah. homeschooling. The wife is working in the morning, so she will be away. But she only works at about lunchtime. So I'll be um, – I've got spelling tests. It's the first thing I've got to do in the morning. So hopefully I've done a decent job if they actually can spell the, or do their spellings. And then uh, we usually get ourselves a little um, – Fish and chips tomorrow evening, so that's what we'll be doing. Here's one for you, Steve. Estino. How do you spell Efa? Efa, A O I F E. Weef. Interesting story. Um, we we're doing. I'm doing these. I'm assuming we're not recording this bit anymore. But uh, we've got this uh, these phonics cards that we're using at home, and I picked one up the other day, and it said Z on it, a Z, a Z, and I'm holding it, and I'm like Z. What goes zzz? 
and she's looking at me. I'm just like, you know what, you know what it is, you know, black and yellow flies around and bear in mind, she's looking at the picture. I'm looking at the sound and she's just literally looking at me like I'm mental. And I'm, this is where the sarcasm came in. I'm going just, you know, we've covered this. We've covered this. Well, I don't know what the problem is. I flip it over. It's a zebra. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, it's been a bit of a running joke in the house all week about zebras flying around the garden. <laughs> so crazy time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, she she literally was looking at me like I was batshit crazy. Like, what what are you talking about? This zebra like on top of a plant, just like taking the nectar out of it. Like, <laughs> 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 